Hello and welcome to Mining Network's monthly Cobalt Outlook. I'm joined today by Greg Miller, the leading analyst on Cobalt and Nickel at Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. Uh, I'm sure most of you are aware of Benchmark's work. They are the leading authority in battery metals and have previously advised the Senate, the White House, Whitehall, multiple governments around the world, um, precisely on the supply chain issues around the battery metals, um, especially uh, with this EV revolution that we're starting to see here. So, Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Let's dive straight into Cobalt. Um, we've in the past seen quite a lot of volatility in the price, um, very high peaks, dramatic falls um, years following. Um, can you give us a bit of background into actually what's been happening over the last few years since we've seen the peak back in around 2017, 2018? Yeah, well, cobalt prices um, rallied throughout 2017 and really peaked in, in April 2018 um, on bullish sentiment, um, which was fueled primarily about the kind of hype over the EV story and, and where the future direction of, of, of the EV revolution. Um, however, kind of in April 2018, the market really turned and prices corrected after it kind of became clear that much of this um, hype, much of it was built on speculation rather than real dem uh, demand um, and, and market fundamentals. So since from 2018, early 2018, we saw um, prices kind of continue to fall um, throughout the remainder of that year and, and into 2019 before kind of largely stabilizing in, in 2020. Um, which actually proved one of the least volatile years for cobalt pricing, largely supported by um, COVID-19 uh, related supply disruption um, in the DRC and in other regions like Madagascar. Um, since then, prices really started with a bang in 2021, um, particularly kind of for battery focused uh, feedstocks and chemicals as um, demand from the battery industry really started to accelerate, primarily from uh, the second half of, of 2020, but by 2021, um, logistics issues in the supply chain really created a, a tightness in, in Q1, which we saw a, a big rebound in, in prices and, and a, a big rally, which um, which wasn't really sustained into Q2 once kind of these logistics issues were were managed to kind of be worked through across the supply chain. But um, and we saw some kind of overstocking in January and February, particularly in China, um, but. Since then, prices have really, the market's been fairly quiet because um, it's, been, it's been relatively tight. Um, but kind of towards late Q3, um, sorry, late Q2, we saw uh, prices begin to rally again. Um, and all that this was, we saw some industrial consumers return to the market. It wasn't big volumes, particularly, this is mainly in the metal market, but um, much of it, a lot of traders are holding on to material and there's a real, there's real positive sentiment around the second half of the year with expectations of higher pricing as demand for both the battery industry and um, and, and industrial uh, sectors kind of continues to improve on a kind of brightening uh, macro outlook. Obviously, we are seeing a bit of a rally now with the pricing, um, but obviously investors will, will know from the 20, sort of 17, 2018, it's similar to lithium in a way. Those that didn't get out when the prices sort of peaked, um, they did get a bit burned. Um, are we... Are we potentially heading into that territory again? Is there a risk that you know the pricing isn't isn't justified as, as much as similar to last time, and, and are investors at risk of of potentially make, sort of cutting some losses um, in the near term? Mm, I don't I don't think that's the case this time around. I've kind of, as I mentioned, much of uh, what happened in 2017 and, and early 2018 was really built on speculation rather than demand fundamentals. Whereas now demand is real, and we're seeing EV sales across the board really accelerating um, and that doesn't have to be slowing down at any any time soon. Um, so we're kind of forecasting deficits to emerge in the global market over the coming years, which are really going to support prices. Um, and in, in the closer term, um, we're after kind of the demand destruction uh, caused by COVID-19 in 2020, we're really starting to see some of that industrial demand coming back to the market in late 2021, um, particularly from the super alloy industry as people start flying again across North America and Europe. Good. And obviously what we have seen a really, really common theme that especially from the battery manufacturers is that they don't want to have a reliance on the DRC. That's where 70% or 65% some years of cobalt does come from. Mm. Um, how much of a shift are we actually seeing from very, very small amounts of cobalt being used in these batteries to, to almost none? Um, and how much of, of that impact are you affect it, are you expecting to affect the uh, the demand and, and ultimately the price of the of the metal over the next ten years or so? 
yeah, as you mentioned, battery makers and, and automakers are, are definitely removing to either reduce the cobalt intensity of their cells or, or eliminate it altogether. But um, I think ultimately, if you look at absolute cobalt demand from the battery industry, it's going to continue to, to increase um, substantially over the coming decade um, as the cell production scales. Um, and, and, and I think an important caveat to that is that we think that the transition towards these high nickel uh, and cathode chemistries um, may actually be slower than, than the industry had anticipated due to kind of challenges around safety. Um, I mean, we saw in 2020 a number of fires in China associated with uh, vehicles that were deployed with uh, MCM811 cells, which is a major risk, a reputational risk for both the, the cell producer and, and the automaker. So we may see that that transition may be slower than, than had been uh, than had maybe previously been expected. And I think. An important point to this is that if you look at Tesla's most recently released uh, impact report, um, they they have mentioned this, that, that, that they expect their overall co and absolute cobalt demand to continue increasing. Although they are working to eliminate it from their supply chain, it's going to remain. Um, it's going to, they, their, their volumes are going to increase um, over the coming years as um, growth as their growth rate is out, expected to outpace the. Um, the rate of cobalt reduction on a per cell basis. Would you be able to run us through the, the latest forecast from Benchmark in relation to supply and demand and, and your actual pricing forecast moving forward over the next few years? Yeah, sure. So we, we're kind of forecasting um, cobalt demand to grow at a 13% compound annual growth rate over the next decade. Um, and, and as a result, we see the market transitioning into a structural deficit from uh, 2025 um, with stock levels kind of being drawn down over the coming years which will lead to that, that structural deficit. Um, in terms of pricing, um, due to tighter market conditions this year, we see, uh, we're forecasting uh, what metal prices to be uh, at, kind of averaging at $21 a pound this year. And, in the, and then in the medium term, the, uh, with the expected deficit um, um, likely to emerge from 2025, and as I said, stock levels decreasing, we see cobalt prices really peaking in the, in the late 2020s. Something I did want to touch on, we have had Glencore in the past um, essentially manipulate the price of, of cobalt um, through the closing and reopening of their Katanga project. Um, is this a strategy that you'd imagine is going to continue? Or are we going to continue seeing these, these large volatilities? It sounds like from your forecast, potentially not, but would be good to, to get your views on it. Yeah, I don't, I don't really see um, Glencore uh, shutting uh, either Katanga or, or Mutanda in the future now. I think uh, much of Glencore's strategy has, has changed and much of their supply now is, is tied into long-term contracts, which is kind of giving them greater visibility over, over the demand, the long-term demand uh, projections for their, their customers. So um, all kind of indications suggest with Mutanda coming on back online next year, they're going to kind of ramp that um, production in line with the demand requirements of their long-term customers rather than flooding the market and, and causing prices to, to crash or trying to manipulate the price in any way. So, um, I mean, ultimately, it's in, in Glencore's best interest to minimise price volatility, um, which, which is obviously a, a reputational damage for cobalt. Um, so, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see that being the case going forward. Yeah, that's, that's the thing with cobalt, isn't it? You've got the volatility and then you also have the jurisdictional risk with the DRC, which, which yeah, a bit of a double whammy. But um, in, in regards to the DRC and future um, supply of cobalt, is there much in the pipeline outside of that jurisdiction that, that we could expect to, to ramp up or, or are we really dependent on, on on what happens within that area yeah no there's certainly there is certainly new supply coming out of new other regions particularly um indonesia where uh, new cobalt, cobalt supply is expected to increase as kind of several um nickel focused high pressure acid leach plants in the region um enter production um over the coming years i mean we saw the first um h power chinese owned h power plant um run by pt large and enter production um, uh, in June this year, I believe, and we were expecting a, the next kind of wave of plants to enter production from 2022 with more in the pipeline out to 2025 and beyond. So we're certainly seeing uh, a significant volume of cobalt coming out of, of Indonesia. Um, and as a result, we really see the DRC's overall cobalt, the share of cobalt supply um, is kind of just, it's forecast to decrease from 74% this year um, to 60% by the end of the decade. But I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, the DRC will continue to, to, to dominate the cobalt market. And for automakers beyond 2025, it's going to be difficult to see where they, they 
can source big volumes outside of the DRC because it's going to be uh, very competitive. And so we still see the DRC being the, the primary and, and, and important um, supplier of, of, of cobalt for the industry. One last quick question, actually, is in terms of substitutes for cobalt, obviously, there's a lot of talk around nickel, uh, manganese and, and some other some other interesting commodities, um, which might be the winners if, if we are looking to move away from cobalt what what what's most likely to substitute it in in the in the greatest way would you say good question i think i mean obviously nickel the trend has been towards the higher higher nickel chemistry at the moment which is substituting um uh, cobalt out of the cell I, I i don't think it makes sense necessary to remove um cobalt completely because i mean once you move to the really high nickel um cathodes your your exposure to cobalt is uh, is fairly limited anyway and and your then exposed to a greater extent to the nickel market, which has its own challenges to overcome. Um, and also we're seeing the, the greater utilization of LFP, particularly in China, um, which is kind of a low cost alternative to, to nickel based cells. So, I mean, there are certainly um, competing technologies. And I think these kind of a, a multi chemistry approach for automakers is, is beneficial for them to, to mitigate supply risks. Uh, and uh, it really kind of represents a hedge against. Um, um, potential supply constraints across all the kind of battery raw material markets, but um, I still think cobalt will have a long term place in the in the EV market. Greg Miller, thank you so much for coming onto the show and sharing your insights with us on the cobalt market. Um, I've learned a lot. Hopefully, everyone else has. Uh, for those who want to continue um, hearing the story on cobalt and, and and have updates, I'd recommend first of all following Greg on Twitter, which is Greg Miller underscore BMI, all one word. Um, I'll also be putting a link to that on screen and in the description below. I'd also recommend uh, signing up to Benchmark's weekly updates as well. They're free and uh, pretty insightful. So, so definitely check that out.